In the headlines on this Monday, North Korean officials are apparently unhappy that a visit by America's top intelligence official did not result in a breakthrough. The North, in the meantime, sends a special envoy to Russia. Japan falls into recession after showing a surprising on-year contraction of 1.6 percent in third quarter GDP. And a video showing the beheading of another American has been released by Islamic State militants. Stay tuned for these stories and more coming right up. It's 6 in the evening on Monday, November 17th here in Korea, live from Seoul. I'm Daniel Che. And I'm Nai Hyun Gyeong. Welcome to Early Edition at 6. Our top story this evening, James Clapper, America's top intelligence official who recently visited North Korea, has talked about his trip to U.S. media outlets. Well, he says North Korean officials didn't seem happy that his visit did not result in a breakthrough in terms of bilateral ties between Washington and Pyongyang. Our Kwon so starts us off. U.S. Director of National Intelligence James Clapper's trip to North Korea was a success in that he freed two American detainees there and crossed visiting the communist state off his professional bucket list. But the trip was apparently not as satisfying on North Korea's end. Clapper told CBS News in an interview over the weekend that North Korea seemed to be disappointed with the trip as there was no diplomatic breakthrough as a result. Clapper says the short letter he carried with him from President Barack Obama mostly stated that it would be received as a positive gesture to free American detainees Kenneth Bay and Matthew Miller. Clapper said the tone of the dinner he had with officials was pretty terse and that this atmosphere kept him apprehensive on whether he would be allowed to bring the captives back to the states. During talks on human rights, officials told him they don't want Washington kicking up a fuss about the issue. Clapper said officials in Pyongyang criticized the U.S. for attempting to intervene in their internal matters. He added that he got the impression the North felt it was under siege. The intelligence chief, however, also encountered a different tone on the sidelines when an official who appeared to be in his 40s expressed interest in Clapper visiting again in the future. Clapper said this seemed to embody the generational divide between the younger and older officials in the North Korean regime. Kwon so Arirang News. And a special North Korean envoy for leader Kim Jong-un left Pyongyang on Monday for an eight-day trip to Russia. Choi ryong hae one of Kim's closest aides, will visit Moscow as well as Vladivostok in Russia's Far East to discuss economic and political ties. Now, speculation is also ripe that he will meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin to deliver a personal letter from the young North Korean leader. Photos released by the Associated Press show Che being, being accompanied by North Korea's vice foreign minister and chief nuclear negotiator Kim Gae-gwan, suggesting that North Korea's nuclear program may be a topic of conversation during that trip. Sino-North Korean ties are said to have gotten worse since Kim Jong-un assumed power in the North three years ago. One of the indications of this is a multi-million dollar bridge which was supposed to boost trade between the two countries but remains closed well after its scheduled opening date. Our Park ji tells us more. This is the new Yalu River Bridge, linking the northeastern Chinese city of Tandong to North Korea's border city of Shiniju. The three-kilometer-long structure was scheduled to open late last month, but Chinese state media reports the opening has been pushed back indefinitely. China footed the entire cost of the 350 million U.S. dollar project, expecting the bridge to boost bilateral trade. But after four years of work, facilities and roads linking the bridge into the border cities remain unfinished. Satellite images taken in September also show that North Korea hasn't started building customs facilities. Compared to pictures taken in October of last year, we see no improvements at all.
In fact, some buildings have been torn down during the time. China and North Korea delayed laying roads linking the bridge to the cities because Beijing is not happy with Pyongyang's nuclear programs, and North Korea is unhappy with its current relationship with Beijing. I don't think the bridge will open until the latter half of next year. Watchers say the holdup completing the bridge, which was supposed to handle some 80 percent of goods passing between both countries, reflects the sour relations between the once strong allies. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Now, smart homes are said to be one of the most promising areas in the Internet of Things, where practically everything we touch and interact with is connected to the Internet. That's right. At first, companies were quick to hook up home appliances to the net. But now, they're exploring products that are not traditionally electronic, like furniture. That's right. Here's our Kim ji yeon with this week's Industry Insight. This user looks up a recipe in front of her kitchen shelf and then checks the prices of the produce and ingredients she needs before placing a delivery order. She also calls her friend to confirm a dinner appointment while uploading a message on the family board to remind them they'll be having guests. This kitchen shelf is an example of smart furniture, and it's not science fiction. It will be a reality in Korea early next year. Korea's largest telecommunications operator, SK Telecom, has partnered up with the country's number two furniture maker, Hyundai Levar, to produce smart furniture. Available on both the iOS and Android operating systems, the devices will allow users to enjoy multimedia content from applications downloaded on a wireless network. SK Telecom says it's the first company in the world to create smart furniture, and the development is in line with its goal of providing better smart home services. We thought that connecting the furniture most commonly used by homemakers would be a great way to expand the market of the Internet of Things because they're mainly going to be the ones using smart home services. SK Telecom says it wants to bring a lifestyle change by adding more functions to its devices, as well as developing other kinds of furniture, including smart beds and sofas for its customers. This is one of my personal favorites, the dressing table. It's very convenient for workers like me who have to get up and rush to the office every morning. I can quickly check the latest news and my schedule while I do my hair and makeup. And there's sensors embedded in the mirrors, which are touch screen. So it's also Bluetooth enabled so I can receive and make calls or listen to my music using my smartphone. And if things pan out as SK plans, this mirror will soon allow users pick their clothes through avatars that try out various outfits in different colors on the screen. SK Telecom and Hyundai Levar say they hope to sell 45 million U.S. dollars worth of smart furniture by the year 2017. And the climate for business looks bright due to the rising demand for smart home devices. Data by U.S.-based market tracker Strategy Analytics shows that the global market for smart homes will grow to more than $100 billion in 2019, more than double this year's total of $45 billion. Kim Jeong, Arirang News. So today was the second trading day for the IT services unit of Samsung Group. Samsung SDS shares closed at around 338,001, which is still nearly double its IPO price. And to help us probe into the topic and possible implications, we have Mr. E. G. Su, attorney at law, solidarity for economic reform, right here with us. Thank you for your time. Thank you for inviting. Okay, so let's start with the share price of Samsung SDS. Now, there are some who say the stock is overpriced. Would you agree with that? Well, no, I don't, because uh, at the IPO, the, the price was set to $190,000. But prior to IPO, if you look at their past tradings, it was traded in the range of uh, 250 to you know $300,000. 190,000 won. One, I'm sorry right. about that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's a, a 
as soon as imme immediately after it went public, there's a, what we call the arbitrary chance, you know. So simply owning the stocks of Samsung SDS, mm -hmm. you will be able to realize some of the profits. And again, uh, other uh, factors are Samsung SDS will still be uh, part of Samsung Group. They have, you know, uh, solid clients like Samsung Electronics and other subsidiaries. They have very uh, uh, future, you know, bright future. Mm -hmm. it's considering all those intrinsic value or, or corporate intrinsic value, I don't think uh, the price that are being traded today is overpriced at mm -hmm. all. And you also wanted to talk a little bit about the shareholders, uh, the, the makeup of the shareholders of the um, Samsung SDS. Right. Uh, I, I don't know whether the screen is available or not, but if you look at the, uh, the, the current uh, you know, shareholdings of Samsung SDS, uh, you know, only 7.88% of uh, the uh, stake which mm -hmm. were held by Samsung Electro uh, Mechanics are being offered to the public. The rest remains uh, intact, which means Samsung Electronics will still maintain its largest uh, shareholder position. And also the family, the controlling family will maintain their uh, stakes in, in the company. So uh, this 7.88% being offered to the public, you know, and there's been a, a huge uh, stir in the market because everybody knows it's a good chance to make a good money. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think we have um, we had a different graph showing there, but what will happen happen from here on? You did say that this uh, is this could be a part of Samsung Group's restructuring process, and there are reports, some reports saying that Samsung SDS could even merge with Samsung Electronics. The reason why Samsung SDS going public is crucial and important to Samsung Group is because uh, I'm not sure whether I can see the second screen. For the convenience of the audience, uh, you know, we must understand some uh, you know ownership structure of the group. Uh, I think we are showing the graph that we were supposed to see <laughs> in the first half, but um, right. Yeah, let's keep that it, in mind. It, that the first graph that right. we just the, showed the, was the most one. important shareholdings of Samsung Group is that Samsung Everland, now called Chail Industries, hold 19.34% of Samsung Life Insurance, and then, but uh, according to our law. Uh, Samsung Everland or Chail Industries is not yet classified as financial holding company mm -hmm. because there is a largest shareholder who is Chairman Lee Gon Hee. Mm -hmm. He owns a bit more than Samsung uh, Chail Industries. Does it does not trigger uh, the law yet? But once you know Samsung uh, Chairman Lee uh, happen, I mean passes away or ha something happens to him. Uh, the stake that is owned by Chairman Lee must be succeeded to transfer to his offsprings. As soon as it is transferred to the next generation, the government, uh, you know, comes in and wants their share, which means the inheritance tax. But uh, this tie, you know, 20.76 percent, is so crucial in order to maintain the corporate control of the entire group. Mm -hmm. Uh, the offsprings or the sons and daughters uh, of uh, uh, Connie Lee would not want that to happen. So they would have to prepare what's called inheritance tax money. Mm -hmm. By having uh, Samsung SDS go public, J.Y. Lee, uh, the, the only son of Chairman Lee, will still have you know, roughly 14% um, of Samsung SDS. With that holdings, he won't divest his shares immediately. They, they will wait until the right time comes. Mm -hmm. When the stock price goes up and comes to a level where he thinks this is a time when I need some cash which means cash out, he will use that cash to pay the inheritance tax that are needed. Mm -hmm. It's such a complex and confusing structure to some, uh, carefully and uh, I guess uh, masterfully orchestrated by the Samsung conglomerate and uh, of course Connie Lee, not to be confused with our Connie Lee, just for your notice, it's Lee okay. Gun and of course his son Lee Jae Yong, who is in the spotlight nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, there's of course a lot of complex cross shareholding restructuring going on in Samsung, but we want to maybe take a time travel back to 1999 a little bit. We do question the, valid, the validity of the shares uh, which were owned by, which are owned by the children of Lee Gun Hee, mm, Lee right. Jae Yong and the two sisters, because back then in 1999 it was bought at below market prices. Right. I don't know how many of the audience would track, uh, you know, the past uh, story of this Samsung SDS, but in 1999 uh, Samsung SDS actually issued something called 
BW's bonds with warranty at a severe discount. Mm -hmm. And that was being challenged at the courthouse. And later in in year 2009, the prosecutors found that, I mean, the, the court uh, you know, announced that it was Guilty. out of law. It was mm -hmm. out of law. So, but then they were only uh, subject to some fines and some time, uh, you know, uh, less than a year of imprisonment. But, but still, the fruit of that transaction is still maintained by those individual uh, key people, such as Lee Hak Soo or uh, those key, um, you know, uh, staff, and also uh, the children of uh, Chairman Lee Kang Hee. Mm -hmm. So people are, are criticizing, and although they've been found guilty, and there are some illegitimate, you know, transactions at that point, they yes. still get to get. Uh, all the profits. Right, there's nothing we can do to stop them. From that's a, that's those a those huge things. loophole in our legal system for sure. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and some are also viewing this as a symbolic, perhaps, uh, move or, or a symbolic uh, situation of the Korean economy and how the corporate governance is a problem right. of the Korean economy right. at the root of this. I mean, one of the uh, facts that are well known in the investment community uh, about our market is that, you know, we have this so-called discount because of discount. the poor corporate mm -hmm. governance and certainly this is one of the uh, you know reasons why we are being uh, condemned like that okay so we'll, we'll have to wait and see and see how this whole situation will unfold thank you very much uh, attorney Lee Jisoo for coming to the studio and sharing your insights with us today thank you digging deeper getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life. Talking with you on air and online. Connecting you with experts on the world's most pressing issues. News and current affairs at its best. With Na Hyung Young and Daniel Che. On early edition at six. U.S. President Barack Obama has condemned it as an act of pure evil. Islamic State militants have released another video showing the decapitated head of a man who is confirmed to be 26-year-old U.S. aid worker Peter Kasich. Now, he was a former American soldier who returned to the region to help refugees through his aid group, Sarah, but was captured by militants in Syria in October last year. President Obama honored Kasich as a humanitarian who worked to save the lives of Syrian injured and dispossessed by the Syrian conflict. Kasich is the fifth known Western hostage to be murdered by IS militants this year. And shifting gears a bit, the Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect program officially debuted this Monday with some analysts predicting it could become the world's third largest stock market. However, some in Seoul are concerned that it's going to have a negative impact on the Korean market. Our Chi Byung Gil has this report. On the first day of trading at the newly launched Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect, Global investors poured money into Chinese stocks, filling the daily quota of 2.1 billion U.S. dollars. It wasn't a full opening, but a new trading link has been set up between the Shanghai and Hong Kong bourses that gives international investors greater access to China's vast domestic stock market. They are now allowed to buy and sell over 550 of the largest A-grade shares listed in Shanghai, directly via the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. The trading volume was higher for investors with Hong Kong accounts buying shares in mainland China, rather than the other way around. Previously, only institutional investors with a secured quota from the Chinese government could invest directly in China's domestic markets. But the new scheme is making foreign investment in the mainland a lot easier, and overseas investors are already flocking in. Around 150,000 people opened investment accounts in just one day. We expect more security agencies to open accounts for their clients over the next few days. China's finance minister announced that foreign investors will enjoy personal income tax exemptions on profits from investments through the Connect program for the next three years. Korean analysts say the move will negatively impact the domestic stock market, and they've expressed concerns about possible capital outflows to China. Kim Young-gil, Arirang News. 
Instead of expanding in the third quarter as many had expected, Japan's economy went the other direction and is now technically in recession. The surprising figures are likely to force Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe to call a snap election as early as next month to postpone a planned hike in sales tax. Our Song Ji-sun reports. Japan slipped into an unexpected recession in the third quarter after logging negative growth for the second consecutive quarter. The world's third largest economy marked negative 1.6 percent growth for the July to September period, far below the market expectation of a 2.1 percent bump. In macroeconomics, two or more consecutive quarters of economic contraction typically signals recession. While exports and consumer spending returned to gains last quarter, they weren't strong enough to offset the impact of a slump in stocks of unsold goods, which means companies can't move forward with additional production. This follows an over 7 percent yearly drop in the second quarter, recorded right after Tokyo hiked its sales tax from 5 to 8 percent in April. That was the biggest fall since Japan's deadly earthquake and tsunami in March 2011. Monday's figures pushed the benchmark Nikkei down nearly 3 percent to just below 17,000, with the Japanese yen exchanging at a seven-year low at lower than 117 yen against the greenback during trading. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is widely expected to call a snap election as early as mid-December in hopes of delaying an increase in the sales tax to 10 percent next year. The high was legislated by the previous administration to curb Japan's huge public debt. Japanese lawmakers say postponing the planned inquiries by a year and a half could add about half a percent to growth. Song ji Arirang News. The proportion of Korea's exports to Japan has dropped to a record low this year. Most of the blame falls on the weakening Japanese yen. Our Hwang ji has the details. The tumbling Japanese yen is weighing on Korean exporters trying to sell their products to the country. Data from Statistics Korea shows exports to Japan in the January to September period this year stood at roughly 24.5 billion U.S. dollars, accounting for 5.7 percent of all Korean exports. That ratio is the lowest recorded since the agency started to compile such data in 1966. During the same period, exports to China took up around 25 percent, while the United States made up 12 percent. And Korean exports to Japan has been on a downward spiral for the past three years. Watchers attribute the drop to Korea's move to diversify its export markets and to the falling yen, which was triggered by the Japanese government's aggressive stimulus measures. The yen has lost a third of its value against the greenback since the end of 2012. The weekend trend strengthens the price competitiveness of Japanese exporters and normally raises Korea's imports from Japan, but that has not happened yet. Experts say that's because of Japanese exporters that are not actively cutting their prices on the back of the weak yen and Korea's sluggish domestic demand that is slowing Korea's overall imports. Hwang ji Arirang News. More than 17 million people die each year globally from cardiovascular disease. And while modern medicine has made surviving a heart attack much more likely, new research suggests more can be done to make sure victims don't suffer another one. Our Connie Lee has more. About one year ago, 73-year-old Lee Young-ho suffered a myocardial infarction, otherwise known as a heart attack. He immediately underwent a procedure to have a stent implanted that would increase blood flow to the heart and is now fully recovered. I do aerobic exercises almost every day and don't have problems carrying out daily activities. However, in another case, a 60-year-old man died two weeks after suffering a heart attack and having a similar stent procedure. So why did one person survive while the other didn't? It comes down to the other two major coronary arteries around the one that first caused the heart attack. The biggest key point is that more than half of heart attack patients had a problem in their other arteries, which in turn affects their death rate. Dr. Park Do-gu of Seoul's Asan Medical Center was one of the researchers on the team that included doctors from Duke Medicine. 
The researchers analyzed 28,000 patients for this study and found that within 30 days of a heart attack, patients with more than one clogged artery had a death rate of 3.3 percent, compared with a rate of 1.9 percent for those who had just one blockage. The latest research published in the Journal of the American Medical Association raises questions about whether and when more procedures for clearing other arteries should be pursued for heart attack patients. Connie Lee, Arirang News. And that's all we have for you at this hour. Thank you for staying with us. This has been Nai Hun Gyal. And I'm Daniel Che. Good day or good evening, depending on where you're tuning in from. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow.